Hi, everyone. It is Shimen Vizzi with the Adoptive and Foster Family Coalition of New York's interview series. Today, I'll be interviewing Lisa Maynard. Let's find out what she had to say and how she supports the coalition, adoptive families, and foster families throughout New York State. And then now, let's go to 2019. Um, you did two workshops. Now you have two more topics that you were talking about. One about managing micro transitions, which is kind of where we're leading on how, I guess it was almost like a buildup for you, like you, you one step at a time for everybody. And then the other one, which I, I loved was all in the family. Why don't you give a little bit about both of those or why you felt those were now important? So micro transitions has to do with all the changes that happen when a child moves from one place to another. Right. So, you know, if I think about my kids who were born in South Korea, they went from their birth mother when they were born. Um, and we don't know how much time they spent with their birth mothers, probably not much, um, to a foster home, to a 28 hour plane ride with a stranger because the escorts are strangers you know, at the time anyway, I'm not sure if the the parents having are having to travel right now to, I don't even know if Korea is doing adoption at the moment, but um, to a stranger getting off the plane after that 28 hours that didn't, by the way, include the travel from the orphanage to, or, you know, I mean, all these, tra all these transitions, right? To being plopped in our lap at an airport. <laughs> I mean, literally, right? Just boom. And all the things that have changed for that child, the number of times that the baby moved, um, the sights are different, the sounds, right? The language um, most likely had never been in an airport or a crowded area before. The smell of our skin and our bodies just because our diet is different. So you're, you know, depending on what your diet is, your skin smells different. Instead of um, faces that are, you know, pretty similar. I mean, when you're in a um, uh, homogeneous um, society, like someplace like Korea, Japan, Vietnam, right? Everybody sort of looks very similar. You've got the very fair skin, you've got very dark hair, you've got very dark eyes. And, you know, my babies came home to, uh, well, I was actually blonde at the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and, and it, a big, loud Italian family, um, and my, on their dad's side, a big, loud Irish family. So all these changes, and every one of those is a micro transition. For our kids who are coming into our families through foster care, how many transitions have they made over the years? Not only from family to family, house to house, the rules are different, the schools are different, the, um, People in the home are different. Are there, you know, other kids in the house? Are there no other kids? So every one of those transitions is a shock to the system. It's like, and you're trying to figure it all out, right? As a child. And it, it really just sort of, it upsets the brain. It shocks the brain. It shocks the nervous system. I think many of people um, don't realize, especially when they're um, adoptive uh, parents to infants, the, they, many of them, and I've interviewed so many people where it's just, uh, well, they're an infant. They don't remember anything. Right. That taboo rasa, right? right? Right. But I, I brought, um, my son home. And then years later, um, I had a biological child and just that simple. Uh, and I hate to say simple because it's me learning as I'm going mm -hmm. and things that, when you look at it, you go, that really makes sense. Why didn't I think of it that way? But when my youngest was crying and I, and I put him on the bed and he fell asleep because he was laying on my t-shirt. Right. Because no one's never really explained it or never heard it. How would I know? I didn't know about the, that my smell was something, my sound was something. And again, makes perfect sense now and you kind of slap yourself upside the head like, well, you know what? You didn't know, now you know. Yeah, you I mean, we don't know what we don't know, right? Exactly, exactly. And it was hard. I was like, that makes a ton of sense. I'm wondering why you kept falling asleep so fast on my shirt, but yeah. so it makes perfect sense. And that's just a tiny 
healthy little things. So micro, like what you're saying, right? But it's huge in their the grand scheme of their journey of life. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And and I I hear that from um, adoptive parents, you know, newborn adoption. It's like what? Well, they didn't know their mother, except well, hello, they grew in their mother, mm-hmm. right? For nine months, hearing voices, knowing sensations. You know, again, the the um, tastes, I mean, they're not tasting, but, you know, um, the food we eat. Yeah, mold makes a big difference. There's a lot of uh, birth families that you eat something that you're craving now. The kids, you know, like there's connections throughout the whole thing. Right. So, right. Well, that's, is that why you ended up going to, to the next one and doing birth families at the same time? <laughs> so oh, yeah. You're leading, yeah. You're leading it along. <laughs> There's a trajectory here. Yeah. Um, well, in the birth families connections, what do we call it? All in the family, right? Right. So, um, so oftentimes people, I'll speak for myself. I didn't want to have a birth family connection when I adopted my kids. It was, you know, very, very honestly, one of the reasons I went to Korea, the, the parental rights were terminated. There was no contact. There was no, you know, you got your you know, spreadsheet of information, and there was no turning back. There was no, um, I wonder if this birth mom is going to go through with it, right? Um, As an infant adoption, when the birth mother has a period of time in which she can change her mind, which I believe is really, you know, appropriate and um, it makes sense. Um, So I was just going to be mom. I just wanted to be mom. That's all I wanted was to be a mom. And so if that was out of the way, I didn't have to worry about birth family at all. And it was literally the day I first told my son that I, you know, I said, I'm your mommy. And I, it hit, like hit me in the head. It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't give birth to this child. He has another mommy. And it was like, wow, that was, it was so profound for me. And so the importance of birth family connection, um, and I've learned more over the years, obviously, um, in 34, almost 34 years, but um, how profound that connection is and how important it is to honor that and bring that into our family to the extent possible is so important. So trying to negotiate um, those relationships uh, in open adoption, which I'm a huge um, advocate of now, I, you know, again, when I was looking at it, I would, it would have terrified me. It wasn't really that big of a, um, a thing at the time, but it would have terrified me. Have some other mom in my children's life, you know, forget about it. But now I'm like, find it so extremely valuable. So how do you manage those relationships? Amazing. Right. But like, how do we manage any relationship? I know. You know, you can think about your your spouse or your partner. Um, you can think about really. You can even think about it. Uh, I I again I use the word simple, but um, I always think of it as a divorced family or um, for people who are not in the adoption journey. You know, you can kind of equate it to like okay, so you have a you're you're separated. Maybe you got remarried, so now you have double right. double that. So now there's more. And right. how do you manage that? And all these families, layer. everyone's got some kind of layer, but they're always thinking that adoption is so different than it's really, it's not really different. It's a managing of your journey of layers intertwining different people. And right. it's like getting married, right? So you get married and you bring in your spouse's family into your family, your in-laws. Right. And some of us are blessed to have really wonderful in-laws. And some people are not so lucky, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's true. There, there's, there, you know, there, there's stuff like in everybody's life. And so, even if, even if you're not so lucky to have wonderful in-laws, you pretty much usually have to incorporate them into your family and figure out how to, how to be in the same room with them, whether it's holidays or weddings or funerals or whatever. You're going to have to be interacting in some in some way. And so you don't have to fall in love with your in-laws. You don't have to fall in love with your child's birth parents, but are there ways to negotiate those relationships so that, that the, the value that they can bring to your child 
knowing their history, knowing, you know, their culture, knowing where they came from, thinking about, you know, your great, great grandfather did thus and such, right? I mean, it's a whole line of people behind every one of us. And so how do we, how do we maintain those connections in a safe way um, for our kids who come from not so safe places, right? But there's still ways to do it. And so that's sort of what that was about.